Good morning, everyone. And a special welcome to our service of worship here. How good it is to meet as family in God's house. If you're visiting with us, we give you a special welcome. Um, there will be tea and coffee later, but that will be after our congregational meeting. We welcome the Reverend Nathan Duddy back to our service this morning. And we look forward to what Nathan is going to say to us from God's Word. As I've just said, there will be a congregational meeting after this morning's service, so please remember to stay for that. And Nathan will be bringing us some important information. There's one home group meeting uh, this week, and that will be in the office tomorrow at uh, 2 p.m. So that's tomorrow, the 5th of December at 2 p.m., the office home group. The Presbyterian Women's Group will meet this Tuesday, the 6th of December at 7.30 in the Minor Hall, when Julian Jordan from Invermessies will demonstrate how to make Christmas floral decorations. All ladies from the congregation will be very welcome at that meeting. There will be online prayer this week on Thursday at 7.30, and if you need joining instructions, please speak to Alan afterwards. We said last week that Whitehead Storehouse is looking for items for their Christmas food hampers, uh, so if you're able to help with that, there are lists, we hope, available at the door uh, with food items on it. Uh, vouchers from local food shops would also be a great help. Some more money came in as donations for the Victorian Street <coughs> Fair, and with gift aid, there will be over a thousand pounds to be split between CAP and Christians Against Poverty. Sorry, CAP, which is Christians Against Poverty and Whitehead Storehouse. Get it right. <laughs> Today is our own gift Sunday. And there will be opportunity later, if you haven't already brought your gifts up, uh, to place them below the tree. These uh, gifts will be given to camp. Our Sunday service next week, the 11th of December, will be led by Stephen McCleary. And there will also next week be a short afternoon carol service at 4pm, which is homebrew led. This is the second Sunday in Advent. On the second Sunday of Advent, the Bethlehem candle is lit. This candle represents love and symbolizes Christ's manger. In Luke chapter two, we read, this will be a sign to you you will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, great to be with you again, um, especially on such a, a poignant Sunday. Um, my prayer is that we will all leave today feeling enthused and excited about the next chapter of what God is going to do here um, in Whitehead. Uh, I do as usual, but I thought um, just maybe to re-emphasize, I carry the greetings of your brothers and sisters up in Downshire. Um, we pray for Whitehead often um, and they, they made sure that I, I carry those greetings today on such a pivotal Sunday for us. But everything we do is to God's glory. Psalm 92 says it's good to praise the Lord, make music to his name. It's good to proclaim your love in the morning, your faithfulness at night, to the music of the ten-string lyre and the melody of the harp. For you make me glad by your deeds, Lord. I sing for joy of what your hands have done. How great are your works, Lord, how profound your thoughts. It is good to praise the Lord. With that in our hearts, let's stand together as we sing our first piece, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. Let's stand. 
stand knowing every word to be true. Let's worship God. Mm -hmm. Be still for the presence of the Lord. say that um, uh, Isaac is, is doing much better. Um, I know that uh, there has been some concern. Um, it's the reason, unfortunately, that we weren't able to be with you during the Victorian Fair, um, but we have received such a, a, an amount of messages that has been quite overwhelming, the care that we feel and the love that we feel from this congregation. So thank you. Um, in the doctor's own words, we were able to get to, it was just a, a, an infection, but we were able to get to it with, without it getting too serious. So thank you for, for your prayers and for your support. Um, it meant a great deal to us. Um, but now we're going to serve the Lord um, with our offering, and then afterwards I will pray. Let's serve the Lord. <laughs>
God, we, especially at Christmas, we know that every good gift comes from you. And so, Lord, as we celebrate um, all the good things in our lives, we take a moment in our offering to give you uh, a, an act of worship. By giving in of our money and our time, we recognize that all money and time is given by you. And so it is right and fitting to worship you in this way. We dedicate it now to you. Amen. Mm -hmm. sing for us and as they do um if they're no you put choir there no but uh, we can pretend that that didn't happen okay i think it was superb we're all gonna <laughs> sing um what can i give to the king it's just a minister clark obsession moment there um what can i give to the king and as we do um any presents that you may have um still to bring up you can bring up during that's singing. So now we're going to be led by the choir, but we're all going to sing together. Let's stand and worship God. preaching on the topic of the Holy Spirit and um, we were looking at the context, the story of where the Holy Spirit is given and the Holy Spirit isn't given in the midst of a, a, a popular worship service or with an American passionate speaker or something like that, no, the Holy Spirit is given 
the twelve scared breathing men who know that they are about to lose the one that they have followed and dedicated their lives to. And the reason that Jesus tells them about the Holy Spirit is why? Is because he knows the intense suffering and persecution that the disciples are going to go through. All but one will be killed for their faith. Some in India, some in Rome, some further afield. But all but one will die because they believe in the name of Jesus. But more importantly, because they will not reject the name of Jesus. You see, they weren't killed because at one point in their life they had followed some wayward teacher. They were killed because at the very end of their lives, when the executioner would ask them one final time, who is the king? And all that they had to say was Caesar, or the local tribes leader, or the king. All they had to do was say that, even if they didn't mean it, and it would go away. But the Holy Spirit comes in those moments and convicts them and us when we go through suffering and times of trial to say, no, Jesus is my King. I will worship him. In our prayers of intercession today, I'd like to pray for those who are still being asked that question. And the reality that you might see is that you are asked that question every day too. It may not be a life or death situation, but it may be when you get a doctor's diagnosis or when you go through hardship or through good times. The world will ask you, who is king? And my prayer is that you would be filled to the brim with the Holy Spirit. Why? So you can have a great worship experience? No. So you can show off and be full of gifts? No. So that whenever it comes down to it, you can say, Jesus Christ is my King. Let's pray together. Father, we know that there are many parts of the world today where people will lose their lives, their families, their livelihoods, where they will face much more than just mocking, but perhaps even physical torment. Because why? Because they believe that you are the King of Kings and they will not back down. They believe that you are the only way, the truth and the life. They are not just words on a page, not just words to be said at a funeral, but words that might demand everything. Lord, our plight here might be different, but it will still go hand in hand with suffering. When bad things happen and we're tempted to ask the questions like, why would God ever do this? How could God ever allow this? That we might go through the process of Job, which is the temptation to curse God and just say, forget about it. But instead, we pray that we would be filled with your Holy Spirit and that we would know that the painting is much bigger than our lives, and that you promise that no ounce of suffering goes unheard or has no purpose. It is all in your plan. So whether it is personal suffering, health suffering, family suffering, or whether it is an intense persecution in North Korea or Iran, we pray, Lord, that we, as a church on this earth, would be filled this Christmas time with your Spirit. And that we would cry out, Abba, Father, Jesus Christ, you are my King, no matter what. Lord, I believe that if you would fill each of us here this morning, we would transform like hell not because of our own ability, but because you have filled us to the brim. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's uh, sing again before we go into the word, Light of the World, and we stand to sing.
to go uh, as we reflect on Advent themes and messages. John chapter 1, verse 1. One of the most famous passages in the Bible. Try and read it as if you're reading it for the first time. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. Who are we talking about? Who is this character? Who is the Word? Jesus, yes, Jesus. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. You see how this passage is so important, because here we have the Trinity in action. We go back to verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, i.e. Jesus, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. 
the true light, Jesus, that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh. Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Then finishing at verse 14. The very first couple of the, of the verses here are about a big theme. Hopefully you can see it. It's the theme of creation. And creation is one of the biggest themes in the Bible because God is constantly generating creation. He is constantly creating. If you think about the universe, we know that the universe is expanding constantly more being created. How? Because of the Lord's will and creative power. He is a creator. He creates things out of nothing. It is a trait that we do not share with him. I can make something out of paper, I, a paper ball, nothing else. Um, but other people can make great things, but they can't do it with nothing. God creates from nothing. And I think that one of the things that, that the author of this book wants us to get is he wants us to see the creation story in light of the birth stories. He wants to paint some similarities. He wants us to see that the stories that have a similar heart, a similar drive. He wants us to see little things in both of the stories that connect the two and therefore bring Genesis and John's Gospel right beside each other, even though you might assume they have nothing in common. One of the, the big things is the correlation in verse 5. If you look at it, can you see the two words that you might see a lot of in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3? One of them is light. <laughs> And the opposite is there too. Darkness. Darkness. The theme of darkness and light is massive in the opening chapters of Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Darkness and light. And the whole theme of the creation story is that God separates light from darkness. He gives a sun by day, moon by night. He creates light where there is no light. That is what he, he is known for in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. From the very beginning of time, we see that God's heart is to create light where there is darkness. But then we see a new light come in, in verse 4. In him was life, <coughs> and that life was the light of all mankind. So in Genesis, we have the sun created light separated from darkness to give nourishment of, of, of our physical beings. But in John, we have a different type of light. Not light to sustain crops or to, 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 to produce apples or pears, but no, this light was to produce a different type of fruit. This light was to cultivate a different type of soil. And it was the soil that you find in your heart, in your soul. It was life in yourselves. Because the fact is, is that since Genesis 3, we had been undergoing a process of rapid decay. The world was decaying. That's what the, the entire story of the Old Testament is about. God creates perfection and it is a slow toke roll to decay and to destruction. 
ending with the people in exile. We don't have time to get into the Old Testament, but it's fascinating. Jesus comes at a time of immense darkness. It's immense darkness for the Israelites, because if you remember, they've been taken over by the Romans. It's an immensely dark spiritual time because the Pharisees are corrupt and care more about rule making than genuine relationship with God. It is a time of darkness, but who comes? What does God do? What has God been doing since Genesis 1, 2, 3? He sparks light. And that light is Jesus. That light is a babbling baby. You couldn't write this if you tried. And yet, it is here for us. God doing not a new thing, but something that he had been doing for time and time again, bringing light into dark places, bringing life where there was no life, bringing it to people, to mankind. Whenever I started my time in Whitehead, and I'm sure you'll remember this, I talked about how in churches we're always obsessed with new things. New things, new ways of doing things, new praise, new, new ways of, of doing things. And that can jar with some people because it's not what we're used to. And yet what I said then was that the Bible teaches us that the best new things are old things. And we see that here. It seems like Jesus coming and bringing light into the darkness is a new thing, but it's not. Because what was Jesus doing in verse 1? What was he doing in verse 3? Through him all things were made. So what does he do in the very first chapters? He breathes and he creates light. What happens in John 1? He breathes and he creates light. That's what God does. It's what he does and is wanting to do in our community here in Whitehead. In dark corners, he wants to bring light. And the great thing is, is that he chooses humans, messy humans, just like you and me, to be part of that plan. So you go back right to Genesis. What is the pinnacle of creation? Or who, I should say. Um, um. If you get it wrong, there is no forfeit. You don't have to leave, okay? Yeah, it's the first the first man. Ad, Adam. Yeah, you know, you know. Adam. You're gonna get you you, you have to you have to get used to this, okay? Um Adam. Yeah, we have Adam and Eve, and they're the pinnacle of this creation story. Okay, and then you come to um, you come to John chapter one, or you come to the Gospels, and it's not a man this time who is this pinnacle or this person who's invited in first. But who is it? It's a young teenage woman, Mary. You see that? I love that. You maybe have missed that, but you have Adam who is created to be the steward over creation. And you have Mary then, who is given the task of stewarding over the light of life. But they both can't do it alone. And so Adam has given Eve, Mary, Joseph. Partnership, men and women invited into the calling of the light. What does John the, John the Baptist says? He says, I am not the light but I'm a witness to it. I'm invited into it. I'm invited to tell people this is the way to the light and this is what the light looks like. And that witness is a, a, an amazing thing that you and I are invited into as well. You don't have to be really good at speaking. You don't have to be really good at standing up and delivering a sermon. But if you can tell people and say, Jesus has done this for me. Jesus has done this for you. You are a witness to the light. You're a picture of what the light is. Your life is a picture of what the light is. But make no mistake, the Christian message is that God could have done this separate from us. 
But what does he do? He chooses broken, humble people to be at the center of the story with him. The first people he comes to are who? Who do the angels come to first? Shepherds. 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 I'm sure you, you know by now, but shepherds were not just outcasts, but they were, they were almost considered to be not even real Jews because they spent so much time away. They were considered so filthy, flea-ridden outsiders. They were considered illiterate. Like, we don't have a, a comparison for them, but they were the worst of the worst in terms. And angels come to them first. And what happens when the angels come to them? What do they do afterwards? They go into the village and they start to, they start to preach Jesus. These filthy, bedraggled shepherds start going in there. Remember, the village is packed because it's census time. So you can imagine all the, all the strangers in Bethlehem being like, yeah, your shepherds are weird. Your shepherds are weird. Why is this shepherd talking to me about Jesus? But that's what they do. They leave their sheep. They go. Because what? Because whenever you've seen the light, you realize that you are invited into it. And you might think, well, I'm not good enough for that. But I bet you you're better dressed than a shepherd. I bet you you smell better than a shepherd. So you're already two rungs up. The, the, the reality is, if a shepherd can do it, you can do it too. Because all the shepherd had was the light has come. We're invited into that to be witnesses. And then finally, maybe you're still thinking, nah, impossible. I could, I could never do that. Or this church could never do that. We need ABC to be able to do that. Well, if there's ever a story about how the ABCs are absent, I would say it's the Advent story. Because you have a teenage girl who becomes pregnant and she has no marital relations. Suddenly she has a clump of cells that are growing in her and they form Jesus. And I don't want to go into the biology of all of that, but that is pretty darn crazy. And so if God can do that and you believe it, then God can certainly use you to transform the world. If God can use dirty, bedraggled shepherds, you can do it too. And if you need it further, just go to Luke 1, 37 to 39, where Mary is in complete disbelief. She's like, what on earth are you talking about? And the angel says something quite, quite important. He says, with God, all things are possible. All things are possible. And I hope that you hold that as we move into our congregational time of meeting, because this sermon is not designed to be separate from that. Please keep that in mind as we head in to our meeting in a bit. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, um, we want to be witnesses to your light and to your life. And Lord, we know that you have not called us to, um, all of us to be these eloquent speakers, but all we maybe need to do is share the story of how you've rescued us over a cup of tea or coffee with a friend. Lord, we pray that you would give us opportunities to bring the light and life of Jesus, the forgiveness of sins, the erasing of our past brokenness and this new identity that we find in embracing you as the light and life of our love. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you. Amen. Let's say stand again as we sing our final piece. Uh, your hand, O oh God, has guided. Let's worship God together.
And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Well, take your seats. Um, maybe um, if the elders could um, sort some uh, chairs on the front for us. Um,